Okay, the intro played twice. Whatever. Hey, guys. It's Monday, the 21st of November, 2022. And we're here to talk about Monday Night Raw. It was the go-home show for this weekend's Survivor Series War Games event. And I thought, pretty good episode of Raw. Wasn't, like, super great or anything. You would have expected more from a go-home show. And I've seen all the criticism online of, ah, this is a weak build for the pay-per-view. And I mean... I wouldn't go as far as to call it like fully a weak build, but I would say that outside of the War Games matches, most other matches on this card seem to not matter. But regardless of that, I thought Raw itself was pretty good. We had a lot of good matches, and Akira Tozawa is no longer a ninja. But Luke, what did you think of tonight's Monday Night Raw? Um, I thought Raw was pretty good. I mean... I feel like they did a good job building towards the war games matches. Yeah, we'll say that. But mm. yeah, like other matches, you know, don't really seem like put a lot of effort into it. <clears throat> then yeah. maybe you could say AJ versus Finn, but the other matches they didn't really put a lot of effort to it. They're going all in on the war games matches because they want it want it to feel like good for like the main roster, right? Because it's it's kind of like helping like build up like future footage, with future like Survivor Series War Games pay per views or premium live events. Oh, in the intro play again, exactly, and that was something that was reported that Triple H wants big moments in these two War Games matches because it's something that he really wants to push going forward, and he wants to not have to either use footage of rings with nobody in them or NXT footage. And as we've seen this year, they didn't use any NXT footage. So I think they did like a warehouse shoot because there was some stuff they showed tonight during one of the Survivor Series commercials that looked like it was shot in a warehouse with a bunch of the different wrestlers in the match. So I think overall Survivor Series should be an okay show. I mean, if we look at the card right now really fast, there's five matches so far announced. We've got the two war, the games. war games match. Go for it. The war games matches will be fun. Oh yeah, I think those matches will be really good. But as far as the other matches, I mean, there's Ronda versus Shotzi. Does anybody think Shotzi's gonna win? No. We got Seth Rollins defending the U.S. title against Bobby Lashley and Austin Theory. Pretty sure Seth retains. And then AJ versus Finn. I don't know who they put over there. That's a toss-up, but I also think that could be a really good match. Anything else, like, I assume they announce, well, they have to. Wait. How do they get to the IC title match? Is that supposed to be the winner of the World Cup or no? Because I don't even think we'll have the two finalists wrestle each other before Survivor Series. So, the winner, they're supposed to fight for the IC title, but I would assume it would probably just be a match on SmackDown for right. that IC title. Because if you look at the brackets, which I don't have up right now, it, the tournament wouldn't complete this Friday to get a match versus the winner and Gunther on Saturday. So it's like, are they just doing these five matches? Is this the card? And they not announce they don't announce anything else on Friday? It almost seems like it. I mean, probably the reason why they got only five matches because they probably want to give the War Games matches like enough time. Oh yeah, to build like good moments. Right. Those War Games matches, like back in NXT, like pretty long. That's what I was just looking up to see some of the times on those matches. Because if we go, say, the last War Games pay per view, the men's War Games match went. 38 minutes. The women's war games match went 31 minutes in 2020. Jeez. In 2020, the men's war games match went 45 minutes and the women's went 35. Well, because if you think about it, the match itself can't be any shorter than, I got to do a bunch of math here, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. The match can't be any shorter than 20 minutes, at least, each one. With all the intervals of five minutes for the first two, every two minutes somebody else comes out. So, yeah, these matches got to go at least 20 minutes each. Well, that's the interesting one right there. Let's see, and then the 2019 War Games, 38 minutes. So, yeah, they go long. They go well over 30 minutes. So, I see, I don't see, I just, there's nothing that I can think of that would be added to the show. But then probably just on SmackDown, they announced the final member of Team Bianca. Yeah, that's what Bianca said tonight. But with that, I want to say thank you if you guys are joining us. If you're joining us live, twitch.tv forward slash PW Unlimited, or you're watching or listening later, whether that's youtube.com forward slash Pro Wrestling Unlimited or podcast services all around the globe like Stitcher, Spotify, Google Pod, Apple Pod, Anchor, iHeartRadio, and so much more. Remember, if you are watching live, you can help us out a couple of different ways. You can either help us out by hitting that donate button down below or by donating Twitch bits in the live chat. Also, remember, you can help us out by subscribing to the channel one of two different ways. You can either subscribe with a tiered subscription or you can subscribe with Amazon Prime. Because remember, if you have Amazon Prime or access to anybody's Amazon Prime account, then you have Prime Gaming. Prime Gaming gives you a lot of cool things like free games, free stuff for games, and they always give you one free subscription to any Twitch channel you want to subscribe to throughout the month. And I'd greatly appreciate it if you did right here, Pro Wrestling Unlimited. Also remember, if you're watching on YouTube, you can go over there and become a channel member. As a channel member, you get early access news, early access podcast episodes, early access non-news videos, and so much more. And finally, head over to the Epic Game Store. Head over to the Epic Game Store and use our code PWUnlimited at checkout. Use our code at checkout when you're buying, whether it's a new game, whether it's an old game, whether it's claiming one of the free games or getting bucks for Rocket League, Fortnite, Fall Guys, or Rumbleverse. Also remember, I've been harping on it. If you haven't played the Spider-Man games yet in the last couple of years, they're both on the Epic Game Store now. Get them and use our code PWUNLIMITED at checkout for all Epic Games and Epic Game Store purchases. As far as Monday Night Raw does go, um, Kevin Owens kicked off the show. Owens said that he joined the War Games team opposite of the Bloodline because of somebody on their team, but not Sami Zayn, who he still considers a brother, which that line comes in later when he makes fun of Corey Graves. Uh, the person he was ready for and coming for is Roman Reigns. He said it's been two years since they fought, and he wanted to remind Reigns that he was the one that almost took the belt from him. He said, if it wasn't for your bloodline, I would have took that title from you a long time ago. Owen said that Reigns has always been hiding behind other people, and that eventually his title reign will come to an end. Crowd chanted for Owens. Owens uh, was on SmackDown thanks to an invitation from some guys. So he returned that invitation and brought them all to Raw as out would come the Brawling Brutes and Drew McIntyre. So Sheamus and his buddies hyped up war games and Sheamus put over Kevin Owens. McIntyre said that his team was ready to rip the bloodline apart. And then Judgment Day came out and I get where this all led to. Judgment Day versus the Brawling Brutes. But it just felt very random and in the moment, didn't make any sense at all. Because it's just, this whole opening thing was kind of just bland. It was very, I want to go after Roman. Roman's in this match. This is how I could fight Roman. Also, here's a bunch of other guys. Let's hype up a match. And then when Finn and them came out, and Finn just goes, oh, hey, by the way, you guys are out there, but I'm going to address AJ Styles. Like, what the, what, what? That was very weird. Did this during like Riddle versus like Seth rivalry? Mm -hmm. Did it like when they were when Riddle was like kind of promo like, and then Damian Priest came out. Yeah, I've been doing this a lot, and it's kind of weird, honestly. I don't, I don't really get it. Right. So, um, Rhea told Drew to shut up because he tried talking over them. 
She said the only thing anyone would be talking about after Saturday was how many women got destroyed by her in the War Games match. Damian Priest then issued a warning before Dominic Mysterio acted tough. He told them to say hi to his deadbeat dad when they go back to SmackDown. This is when Finn then said that he's ready to collect on AJ Styles on Saturday. He told the men in the ring that they would get smashed at, at Survivor Series and that next time they want to interrupt on Raw, Judgment Day isn't going to be so nice. Jamieson said that our houses in Ireland may only be 10 miles apart, but he considers Balor to be a plastic patty, whatever that means. I have no clue what that means. Balor then took offense. So Sheamus challenged him to a match, and he actually challenged the entire Judgment Day. Balor accepted, and we had a six-man tag to open up the show here. Cool. Owens was also on commentary, and Owens, at one point, was talking about his relationship with Sammy, and Corey Graves goes, yeah, you said that you and Sammy are like best friends, and he goes, you don't pay attention, do you, Corey? I said he's like a brother, and by the way, I've turned down my brother plenty of times in the past, so I thought that was pretty funny. He also made a reference when the crowd started chanting at Dominic, who's your poppy? He made a reference to his dad, Terry, and was like, yeah, unlike Dom, I'd never turn on my father. Also, he's got a cool dad, Rey Mysterio. I thought Owens was great on commentary. But as far as the match does go, six-man tag team action, Sheamus, Ridge, and Butch against Finn Balor, Damian Priest, and Dominic. Judgment Day controlled early on as we went to a commercial break, not long into the 14-minute match. Dominic got a lot of heat when he was on offense, and the crowd cheered when he was forced to face off with Sheamus. Dominic tried to escape, but was cut off during, his ent uh, during an entrance of the OC that distracted him. Sheamus sent Dominic back into the ring post, but Priest saved Dom from, be uh, from a beating. Everyone traded some big moves until Dom put Sheamus in a schoolboy and got a two off of it. Sheamus followed this up with a knee strike, and then 10 beats of the Baldrin and a bro kick to pin him to the delight of the fans. Like, he kicked Dominic in the face, pinned Dominic, and the fans loved it. I thought the match was fine. It was a good six-man tag team match, but it's like everything that led up to it, the like 10, 12 minutes before that, was just kind of random and meh. a weird build-up, though. Yeah. Very weird. Kathy Kelly... Interviews Johnny Gargano in the back. Well, actually, no. After the match, Judgment Day attacked after they went after Sheamus. But he fought off Priest before Luke Gallows knocked down Priest with a kick to the head. Owens then laid out Balor with a stunner, which is interesting that he went after Finn Balor. Didn't expect that. That was kind of weird. While well, when they were first, like, the uh, Judgment Day was first attacking in the Brawling Bruce, the OC was just standing there just casually talking right and like right when damian priest walked up to him that's where they attacked like even like charge into the ring to attack i thought that was kind of weird so to the back kathy kelly and johnny gargano basically gargano wanted miz in a match tonight with no bells no whistles no anything he said that he wouldn't get involved in miz's match with dexter as long as he gets what he wants tonight after Gargano entered the ring, Miz came out wearing a suit and his hand all taped up. He claimed, well, I can't fight you tonight. I'm injured from doing a TikTok. He said something about he sliced the cactus and he won. However, he found Gargano a suitable replacement. Since Saturday says Johnny got new music, I didn't see Johnny's entrance at all. So Johnny got new music? Yeah, he did. It's basically male version of Rebel Heart. Oh, well, that's weird. Instead of, instead of a female singing it, it's a male singing it. Oh, I'm going to have to go back and check that out. Because that is, like I say, a lot of times theme songs just kind of whatever to me, but that's one that I've liked, so I'm going to have to check that one out. But I did not see Johnny's entrance at all, because I was like simultaneously making dinner at the same time. So and Also, like, I remember, I remember him saying this in one of his Twitch streams. He said Rebel Heart is theme song. He he said he requested a female singer because, mm -hmm. like, something about, like, not a lot of, like, female versions, theme songs in WWE, so he wanted to, like, do something different. Right. I thought it was kind of weird they had a male version of his song. Yeah, I remember him saying that as well. 
So Miz found a suitable opponent, and that suitable opponent was Omos. Match itself in about three minutes. Miz was on commentary, but left to interfere, and suddenly his hand was better. Gargano confronted him, and Miz backed off. Gargano avoided a charge by Omos, whose head hit the ring post. Gargano hit a thrust kick with Omos on his knees and seemed to be leading to a victory when another weird thing happened. So Johnny's climbing to the top rope. And Johnny doesn't even get all the way on the top rope before he knows what his next spot is and just goes right to it and slides right off. Like he's got one foot on the top rope. And then he just slides his whole body over the ropes, off the top rope, right into Omos, a choke slam. Omos stands up, boom, boom. Very awkward transition here. He didn't like go to the top and then try to jump off. He literally put one foot up on the top rope and just slid right down into Omos. Omos pins him with a choke slam. Kind of an ugly finish. So Seth Rollins is going to do a sit down interview. But before the sit down interview, they did announce that Seth will be defending the United States Championship in a triple threat on Saturday against both Austin Theory and Bobby Lashley. More on those two later. Rollins was interviewed. This is like, a, Go for it. This is like another, like, let's say, like, Ash on Mustafa Ali, but it's just another yeah. reason why this whole like Ali trying to go after the title means nothing now. Like, all he got is ass beat, and I'm like, I I could be completely wrong on this. I think there's gonna be something where week after week after week, Ali just keeps getting beat and beat down and beat up, and then he's gonna somehow sneak into a big win. Like, whether it's against somebody like a Bobby Lashley or they do another tournament and he wins a match in the tournament and then all of a sudden just goes on a roll and gets a push. I feel like that's going to be, like, this is all done on purpose for storyline purposes. I could be completely wrong. But I just don't see them making such a big emphasis on Ali's always losing for it not to lead to something. Something. Come on. I do agree. At least that's the lead to him, like at least getting a title shot. Yeah. Uh, Johnson in the Twitch chat says, "Did Seth come off as a heel in this interview?" I don't think it was that he came off as a heel, but he's still the same character, the the well, not Messiah, but like the revolutionary thing, and just doing that character is still even now as a quote baby face still kind of heelish kind of like Sasha Banks when she's supposed to be a baby face and she's the boss and she does the cackle laugh and everything it comes off like a heel even though she's not supposed to be so it's a character thing the character aspects of the character are always going to come off a little heelish but Rollins was interviewed by the announcers via quote satellite his backdrop was lit with bright green and purple lights Rollins claimed that he felt better than ever and told Corey Graves that he's the one who actually asked for this triple threat match after everything that went down last week. Rollins basically said that he knew how to outsmart both Lashley and Theory. He said he didn't blame Theory for trying to cash in two weeks ago. In fact, he thought it was a great idea. But Theory was an idiot for what he did last week. He suggested Theory call Cody Rhodes to ask about rehab because, well, Rollins is going to send him out packing as well. Rollins went on for a while before saying that he'd retain the title. And then Dustin Rhodes would send a tweet out that just said, at Seth Rollins and a big middle finger emoji. <laughs> Is Cody Rhodes supposed to be back? Hopefully. Uh, the, the hope was always rumble. So another two months. Does he, he tear his bicep like in May or like June? One of them too. June, I want to see. Let's see. April, May, June. Yeah. Recovery time is normally like nine months, I would say. Well, Triple H came back in five. Five to six. Elias even came back in like five or six. So they were saying, everyone was saying, Cody's going to be out for like seven, eight months. That's what the prognosis was originally. So if you go June, July, August, September, October, November... December, January 7. Hopefully he's back like within the next two months. Uh, so Theory was watching this interview backstage. 
They cut to him, and he cut a very serious promo. Corey Graves alluded to this later on when he's like, he doesn't have the cell phone. He's very more serious. He doesn't have his crutch and stuff, so he's just got to act differently. But he said that he wasn't the same guy that Rollins knew before. He suggested that Rollins and Lashley watch what he does tonight, actually next, to Mustafa Ali, which led to a five-and-a-half-minute match between himself and Ali. Ali hit a perfectly timed super kick early on as Theory tried to go for a rolling drop kick. Theory took control until Ali hit a sunset flip bomb and a 450 splash, but then Theory rolled to the apron before Ali could go for the cover. Theory knocked Ali off the apron and Ali collided with the barricade before Theory hit an A-town down to pick up the victory. Again, five and a half minutes. Not much happened in this match, though. Like, there was a couple spots by each guy and then it was just over. be interesting what like, are they changing theory's gimmick sort of well kind of he's just supposed to be more serious he's not i feel like he's not supposed to when he did the whole cell phone thing and no offense to the to the comment i'm about to make he came off like just a bratty teenager like almost kind of like the rich kid at school that thinks that everything's been handed to him and so now that he doesn't have, you know, Mr. McMahon behind him, he doesn't have money in the bank as his little fail safe, he's got to get serious and grow up is how it, how it coming off to me. So it seemed like Theory was going to attack Ali after the match, but Bobby Lashley would appear on the screen. Lashley told Theory, hey, hey, don't do anything. I'll be down there in a second. You're going to get what's coming to you. Then we go to break, come back, and Lashley enters with a microphone. Lashley was surprised that Theory was still in the ring and insulted him for failing his cash-in attempt. Theory said that he'd be the United States champion if it was not for Bobby Lashley and reminded Lashley that he lost to Brock Lesnar recently. Theory told Lashley that he wasn't the same guy as before and he planned on walking out of Survivor Series the United States champion. Lashley didn't think that Theory would even walk out of tonight's show. Lashley then suplexed Theory and tossed him around ringside. Theory hit him with a chair, but Lashley no-sold it. Theory sprinted to the back, and Lashley chased after him, and then I don't know what the hell this was. So, well, I kind of do. So, they sprint into the gorilla. There's a bunch of people there, and there's trainers checking on Ali. Like, why are you checking on Ali here? You bring him to the damn trainer's room. Anyways, they're checking on Ali and Gorilla. And Theory runs in. Lashley runs in behind him. So what does Theory do? He grabs Ali and throws him into Lashley. So then Lashley goes, oh, well, then I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to bring him back out on the stage and I'm going to beat his ass. Screw Theory. Like, what? Come on. Like, there's got to be. Oh. Go for it. Well, Mustafa Ali kind of like pushed Bobby Lashley. Kind of I mean, like, what the heck, man? A little, but you can also just say he was trying to get up. <laughs> but it's like, this, this has got to be leading to something with Ali getting a push in the end. Like, it, it's got to. If if not, then it's like, geez, does Triple H hate him as much as Vince did? Vince hate Ali? Huh? Vince really hate Ali, though? I don't think it was Vince hated Ali. That may be too harsh of a thing to say. But it was more of Ali would push back on creative and Vince didn't like that. So then Vince would either sit him at home or book him bad. I mean, they started off strong with Ali at first when yeah. they put him on the like, main roster stuff. Oh, yeah. But I, I, there's just something in the back of my head that's like, no, this is all for something. He's going to get some fluke big win. And then it's just going to bleed into like a big major push. Like, I feel like he's either going to eliminate somebody big from the Rumble, which is then in turn going to lead to a big match after, or he's going to maybe finally get a singles match against Seth, beat Seth with the titles not on the line to lead to a title match, and then maybe even beat Seth for the. I don't know. I just, just something. Like, they can't be. 
just beating the shit out of this guy every week for nothing. I don't see them doing like if it was Vince booking it, I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Vince, he needs somebody to beat. But I just with Triple H, I feel like Triple H is doing this for a reason. Could be wrong, but I don't know. I just thought of an idea. Go for it. So, like, what if in the Rumble, Ali like eliminates Seth? Seth gets pissed off, and he goes back in the ring just to eliminate Ali. Could set up something right there. Yeah, then that could lead to. You know, Seth going, yeah, you eliminated me. I'm going to fight you. And then Ali's like, well, I want the title on the line. And then maybe that's how Ali can win the belt. All kinds of options. I just think there's something here. And it's not just, well, he's the guy right now that everybody can beat. You know, who is people or who are people that everybody can beat? Seems like that's the Alpha Academy. They're just always getting beat. And then I... No different when they had a 16-minute match. Match did not need to go this long against Matt Riddle and Elias. And, like, the first eight minutes went to commercial twice. And I didn't even get any notes from that because it was, like, match, 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 commercial. Match, match, commercial. Like, there's nothing that happened in the first eight minutes between all those commercials and stuff. I mean, after the second commercial... Chad Gable gave Riddle a German suplex on the apron, and that's really when the match started to hit a stride, it felt like, because it just finally went eight minutes straight. Riddle kicked out of a Steinerizer, and Elias made a comeback on Gable. Alpha Academy double-teamed him, and Gable hit a flying headbutt, but Riddle broke up the cover. Riddle made a blind tag and hit Gable with some strikes before wiping out both opponents with a dive. Riddle flipped out of a Chaos Theory suplex and hit a knee strike. Elias hit a drift away on Gable, and Riddle followed with a floating bro to pick up the victory. So, I mean, the match was good. I enjoyed the match a lot. I just felt like it was a little long. And the first half of it, with so many commercial breaks, just was there. I couldn't tell you much of what, anything that happened. I'm getting a little bored of this, like, that and Elias against the Alpha Academy kind of thing. Oh, yeah, it, it's dumb because... Riddle won freaking the fight pit and then got nothing after it. Nothing. McIntyre. Very, very oh. like, big down, very big downgrade. Like Seth got like a U.S. title shot. Seth had the U.S. title shot planned. Like they, they announced that before the, when they announced Seth was getting the U.S. title shot on that raw after extreme rules. I knew one of two things were happening. Either Seth was winning or Riddle was going to win, and it was going to lead to nothing. And what happened? It was Riddle winning, leading to nothing. Like, why did we need the match at all? If it led to Seth losing, and then winning the title, and then Riddle just going back to being a goob. I'm going to say it. He's just a goob and a stoner backstage. Honestly, I don't even think, in storyline, Elias likes him. They're doing the Randy Orton thing all over again with Elias. Because Elias keeps getting annoyed by him. They kind of do that when Riddle was in NXT, though, like him and Pete Dunn. Yeah, basically. I feel like they're doing the same thing, but it's Riddle and Elias. Yep. For the most part. McIntyre, he approaches JBL and Corbin, are in the back playing poker. Seems like that's what they do every week, for the last couple of weeks at least. JBL dished out some insults before McIntyre challenged Corbin to a match. JBL said that you may have beat Corbin at WrestleMania, but if I was there, that wouldn't have happened. Corbin then wanted to settle their beef. McIntyre looked at JBL and said he respected his elders, but not Corbin. McIntyre then punched Corbin and told him, find me in the ring. There was a video, uh, video hyping up the men's war games match, and the announcers ran down the card. We then move on another long match. This match went almost 18 minutes. It was Drew McIntyre against Baron Corbin. Again, like I said, another long match that did not need to go this long at all. They went to a break after a double down spot a few minutes into the match where McIntyre hit a headbutt and Corbin followed it up with a clothesline. Corbin hit a superplex off the middle rope at one point and got a two off of it. McIntyre hit a spine buster for a two and Corbin hit a choke slam for a two of his own. 
McIntyre hit a future shot DDT, but Corbin ducked a Claymore and hit a modified Samoan drop for a two. Corbin got upset and drove McIntyre into the announce table and the ring post, but then McIntyre suplexed him and shoved him back in the ring. McIntyre set up for a Claymore, but got distracted by John Bradshaw Layfield, who simply walked up to the steps behind him. Didn't do anything, but walked over there. Corbin used the distraction to hit a deep six and get a near fall off of it. Then we see Akira Tozawa. As Corbin's arguing with the ref, Tozawa suddenly appears, no longer wearing the ninja costume. He has bleached his hair back to what his hair was when he was in Japan. And he steals the hat of JBL and then runs off with it and JBL chases him. This distraction of Corbin led to McIntyre hitting the Claymore and pinning him 1-2-3. They made a big deal stating that this is the first loss of Baron Corbin since JBL has been around. I mean, it was kind of obvious that McIntyre was going to win. Oh, he had you to. Gotta keep him, had to keep him strong for war games. Mm. We then had a OC Judgment Day segment. Kathy Kelly interviewed. So they said, we're going to have an exclusive interview with the Judgment Day next. And Kathy Kelly literally interviewed them for not even a minute and a half. She asked AJ Styles and subsequently the other members of the OC, which apparently Mia is a full-fledged OC member. She's not just like with them right now against Judgment Day and Rhea. They basically said she is part of the OC, which is cool. Styles said that it was a shame what things have come to because he used to be close with Finn, which I don't. And maybe it's just because I didn't follow the independence and New Japan and stuff that much back in the day. But I don't remember Finn and AJ being on many, if any, like shows together before Finn came to WWE. Like they kept talking about their super close bond. Well, it, 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 you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't it like Finn left for WWE and boom, AJ got slotted right into that spot in New Japan? I mean, that's what I was always under the impression of. So I think on this, I think when it was Finn Balor's last match in New Japan, was, I think he was facing Taguchi, right? I believe so, which would make total sense because of how him and Taguchi were tag partners and then him turning on Taguchi built Bullet Club, and yeah. But yeah, he faced Taguchi. He lost that kind of like put him out of New Japan that same night. AJ Styles became the new leader of Bullet Club. Right. So, so maybe it's like you took over like Bullet Club for me. Like when I had to leave, I don't know. I'm trying to see if there's any like Prince Devitt, AJ Styles match or team up or anything. And it's like, I was like a find other than there's WWE stuff. So I don't know. It's just a very weird thing. Balor would approach though. He said, quote, you think I'm a bad guy? You're wrong. I'm worse. I'm the devil. And when you dance with the devil, you never dance again. So I guess both AEW and WWE have devils now. Judgment Day and OC would brawl. And we hear freaking Rhea just go, Hey, Mia! And she, boom, kicks her right in the head. I laughed my ass off. Just the way she screamed, Hey, Mia! Also, I want to say thank you on Twitch to Maxed Puma for the Tier 1 subscription. Really do appreciate that. Thank you for that. But they all start brawling. And then they start fighting outside. They slip into the parking lot. They got a cool overhead cam shot. And um, they're going, they're going, they're fighting around this this randomly placed right in the middle SUV. Corey Graves says, I don't know whose rental car that is, but whoever it is better have the extra insurance. Then they finally get a camera like on surface level or whatever you want to call it. And Carl Anderson slammed Dominic on the hood of the SUV. Officials eventually ran out and separated both teams. Also, Interestingly, there was a production truck in the background, and on this truck had pictures of John Cena, Lita, Booker T, and Eric Rowan. What? Let's see if I can find 
a picture of that on Twitch really fast. I can't even see that. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to pull it up here. See if I could find that. I mean, unless I saw it wrong. And me and there I'm uh, possibly could have. But I thought I saw. Yes, here it is. Here it is. I'm going to pull it up on Twitter right now. They had a truck with Eric Rowan's face on it. Pull it up on the screen. Like, are you kidding me? What? what? Right there. Eric. So you see Lita and Booker on this truck. Then you go to this truck over here. Eric Rowan on the left. Like, he's been gone for like two years. Very weird. Very weird. Unless they end up bring him back anytime soon. I don't know. I mean, they could. But why would they put his face on the truck? Unless they, like, forgot to update the truck. Yeah, I don't that's know. exactly what it was. Or, 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 it's just an old truck, and maybe they wanted to use a different truck, and that truck wasn't serviced or something. I don't know. Now I'm trying to make excuses. For like a reason why they would have had that truck. To, I don't. Very odd. But yeah. Eric Rowan's face. So then Bianca Belair, Asuka, and Alexa Bliss come down to the ring. They hype up the War Games match. And they also mention that there's another member of the team not there with them right now. Meechin. And I go, Meechin? Is that like a nickname for Mia Yim? Who the heck's Meechin? Well... Looks like Mia Yim's name may have been changed. I'll pull this up on the screen because Corey Graves, no, Bailey first calls her Meechin. And then Corey Graves calls her Meechin Mia Yim or something like that. But if you go to WWE's website, and let's just do this live right on the screen. You go to WWE's website, you go to search, and you search for Mia Yim. So you go Mia Yim. Oh, it doesn't come up like it did earlier. It's different. They've already changed it. So if we type in Meechin, and you go here, Mia Yim. You can't even search her as Mia Yim anymore. You were able to about an hour ago. Now you can't. They've changed her name to Meechin. Now you may say, what's a Meechin? Well, in Korean, Meechin means crazy. I don't know what facilitated this because there were still people calling her Mia and Mia Yim, but then there also was only calling her Meechin. So, because it was like, like I said earlier, when the OC and the Judgment Day were brawling, you hear Rhea yell, hey Mia! And then she kicks her in the head. So, I don't know what this Meechin stuff is, but her .com profile has been changed from Mia Yim to Meechin. Now, hold on. I want to check one more thing on WWE's website. So if we go to the actual like full roster pages and not like the individuals, I want to see if it's been changed there as well. So if I go, she's a raw roster member, go raw, go to M. Yep, it's been changed there as well. It just says Meechin, not me M. Very weird. That's, a, that's an interesting one. And it's like, yes, they've changed her name on the website. Some people called her Meechin. But it doesn't seem like it's like a hard and fast, that's the only name you can call her when others were still calling her Mia, like Corey Graves on commentary and Rhea Ripley. I feel like it's just one of those things, you know, like Triple H, you know, some people like in promos will call him Hunter or like The Miz, people will call him Mike. Yeah. I feel like it's just one of those things, like her name, her, they changed her name to Meechin, but like sometimes people will call her like, hey, Mia. True. Thing. Um, since that says did Carl Anderson call her that last week? Uh, if he did, I don't remember. So Bianca Oscar and Bliss were out there. They hyped up war games, and Bianca did let us know that we still have one more member to announce for our team, the babyface women's team, and that member will be officially revealed this Friday on SmackDown. So we have to wait all the way to SmackDown to find out who the final member of this team is. Damage control would come out along with Nikki Cross and Rhea Ripley. 
Bailey said that, you know, she said some stuff about Asuka, basically. And then Asuka just yelled at her, hey, shut up. Ripley then warned Asuka that tonight would be a repeat of what happened to WrestleMania 37 when she beat Asuka. Asuka then said, oh, really? And she started yelling in Japanese and then said, let's just fight right now. They all started brawling. And the match actually finally started. So this match went 16, almost 16 and a half minutes. It was a really hard, hard, hard like, fought battle as far as the two were, like, looked like they were really slapping each other at times, really hitting each other. And the match started off with Asuka just smacking Rhea Ripley in the side of the head. And then she went for a running hip attack. Ripley stalled a long time early on before going back into the ring on the outside. Ripley then yanked Asuka down by her hair at one point and clubbed away at the back of her head. They traded submission attempts early on until Ripley slammed Asuka face first against the mat. They then smacked each other in the face before Ripley drop kicked Asuka off the top to the outside. After a commercial break, Asuka dodged a charge and Ripley went shoulder first into the post. Asuka fought back with some kicks, a back fist, and a code breaker, and then a German suplex for a two. Ripley applied the prism trap, her standing clover leaf, but Asuka slipped out of it. Ripley went to the top, but then Asuka yanked her down and hit a sliding knee. There was a strike as well that got a two. Ripley then came back with a headbutt and a northern light suplex for a two. Asuka countered a riptide attempt, and, and she countered it right into a submission. Damage Control and Nikki Cross, who were shown in the back when the match started, they were shown watching on a screen, ended up all of a sudden just poof at ringside. They're just out of nowhere, just appeared. So they're at ringside, and all of a sudden you see, I think it was, uh-oh, we just lost the stream. Uh, give me one second. Stream just went down. And stream's back up. We're still recording this. We're fine. So all of a sudden you see, I think it was Dakota maybe goes, they're coming, they're coming, and out comes Bianca and Bliss. I thought they would have all just stayed at ringside, but they didn't. I don't know. Um, where was I? Damage control. Yeah, I already said that. Ripley was distracted at one point, and Asuka applied an arm bar. Ripley countered it, though, and got a two off of it. They traded counters, and Ripley hit a riptide for a, just a clean pinfall. No shenanigans, no nothing. She just hits the riptide. One, two, three. Boom. The heel team gets the advantage. Very interesting finish there. Of Asuka getting pinned clean. No interference. No nothing. Then the teams brawl at the end of the show. Meechin shows up. She brawls as well. And then I feel like they ended early. Ish. Like they're brawling. And then they had to stall for time. Corey Graves and Kevin Patrick start running down the card for Survivor Series. And then all of a sudden Corey Graves is in the middle of a sentence. And it's like, and here's a preview. For USA Network's new show, Barmageddon with Blake Shelton. I'm like, well, what was Corey Graves saying? They cut. At least my feed on the USA app just cut halfway through a middle of a sentence. But anyways, your thoughts on the match. Why I see why the stream keeps buffering. I mean, match was good. And, you know, kind of weird that, like, I thought maybe someone from Team Push Control was going to interfere. So did I. Because we've seen stuff like that in the past in NXT, and like I know that's not really saying much because you know it's totally different from like main roster stuff. But you know we've always seen in the past where if the heels win that match to get the advantage, they always like cheat to get that win. Mm -hmm. But again, I kind of expected Damage Control to get that advantage. Well, yeah, it's it's always going to be it. That's why, like, on Friday, I bet you the Usos win as well. The heels usually have the advantage in war games. I mean, the last time where we saw a babyface get the advantage was the women's war games match last year. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about that. I'm going to say, say this. Like, during that match, they made Dakota Kai look dumb. Yeah, they did. I remember that. Yeah, they did. She she was on top of the ladder. Like she could have like grabbed that briefcase or contract, whatever they had up there, 
And she's like, nope, I'm going to jump on yeah. Billy Ray one more time. So dumb. So dumb. But with that, that is our thoughts of Monday Night Raw. Overall, I thought it was an okay show. Wouldn't call it great or anything. Wouldn't call it a memorable go home. And it, it did stuff to get us interested for the pay-per-view or the premium live event. But I think it could have done just a little bit more for all these secondary matches that we have. And as far as Raw does go, there's literally only two secondary matches. Uh, let's see, two. Yeah. Raw's got two secondary matches. SmackDown's got one. But I thought it was an okay episode of Raw. We still got SmackDown to go. Yeah. So. But with. Probably save some stuff for SmackDown as well before they. True. Well, hence why they're not going games. Right, hence why they're not going to announce the the final woman till Friday. It's like, hey, we need something to get people to watch SmackDown. So with that, now it's time for us to figure out what you guys thought of tonight's Monday Night Raw. Remember, you can text in to 510-906-1341. Again, that is 510-906-1341 to let me know what you thought of tonight's show. Before we do that, we got to check the polls as far as the Twitch poll does go. 83% liked the show. 17% thought it was just all right. As far as the Twitter poll does go, whoops, wrong button there. As far as the Twitter poll does go, if it'll load, I'm having really bad internet connection issues right now. Uh, 48% liked the show, 44% thought it was just alright, and 7% did not like it. And finally, the YouTube poll. Check that here. YouTube community poll. 66% liked the show, 24% thought it was just alright, and 9% did not like it. Some of the comments on YouTube. Uh, this person says it was pretty good. This person says, Raw needs to move back to two hours. The show was hard to watch. It started, oh, well, this is somebody probably not in the United States then. He said it started at 9 p.m. until 2 a.m. Okay. Um, starts at 5 o'clock for me, so. Um, this uh, show wasn't amazing in any way, but a really good episode to whet the appetite for Sunday. Exactly. That's basically the analogy I was trying to make. And this one says, Meechin, come on, Really? As far as the text messages do go, it says, who's your pick in the men's war games match? Well, we'll be doing predictions later on in the week. I'll let you know then. Um, this person says, I saw on a wrestle talk, apparently Dana Brooke was to be part of the survival. Yeah, no, 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 I n no. And this person says previous war games matches would have people face off in a ladder match to decide which team starts. Why do you think they changed it? Because it's main roster and they just wanted to do something different than NXT. Because they want the main roster War Games match to have their own identity. They don't want them to just be like, oh, Triple H is doing the exact same shtick he did in NXT. They just want it to be different from NXT. I mean, that's kind of why they're doing 5-on-5 five five mm -hmm. main roster. Because normally in NXT, it was always 4-on-4 four four or maybe in the first one, they did 3-on-3-on-3. Three on three on three. They've done five on five, the, didn't they? I think they did. Well, wasn't it? Oh, I'm trying to think. Because no, maybe I'm wrong. Because wasn't it Pat McAfee? Nope, that's only four. Pat Butch, Oni Lorcan, Danny Birch. Okay, never mind. I was thinking there was a fifth person in that, but Ridge Holland was in the group but out injured. So that's where I was confused for a second. So no, yeah. I don't think they ever did five on five in NXT. It kind of also makes sense as well because you know the bloodline they got five people. So yep. Get five on five there, then just do five on five for the women's. Exactly. So with that, I do want to say thank you if you guys are watching live. Sorry if you're watching live for any of the connection issues. If you missed anything because of that, the stream will be up on YouTube here shortly in its entirety. But with that, I want to say thank you if you're watching live, twitch.tv forward slash PWUnlimited, or if you're watching or listening later, whether that's youtube.com forward slash Pro Wrestling Unlimited, or podcast services all around the globe like Stitcher, Spotify, Google Pod, Apple Pod, Anchor, iHeartRadio, and so much more. 
We will be back live Wednesday following AEW Dynamite. I'm going to stream some Warzone later. If my internet, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, wants to actually work properly, then maybe I'll stream some War Games in a little while, or Warzone. So with that, guys, have a great rest of your Monday night, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one, guys.